Hello there, my fellow spice addicts, and welcome back to some more lore from the wonderful universe of Dune. Most of you who do know a thing or two about Dune will probably agree that one of its most iconic aspects, and why not its mascot of the entire setting, are the gigantic sandworms. I actually did make a video on the sandworms, and it was among the first episodes in this playlist. You may also know that the Fremen famously ride the giant sandworms. What we never talked about though is the process of sandworm riding and the requirements. So today that is what we're gonna be doing, as I do find it a very interesting and detailed process. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us ride a sandworm, shall we? So, first and foremost, in order to ride a sandworm, you need to attract it. And to attract it, you need a so-called thumper. The thumper is the Fremen apparatus used specifically to attract sandworms. It is an indispensable tool for travel and even survival. The Fremen thumper was a spice plastic stake pointed at one end and attached to a spring-driven clapper at the other end. Zensuni records give credit for the invention to one Naib Trekam of Siege Alrab. Predecessors of the Thumper include another tool known as an impact hammer. This was used by Imperial geologists before the invention of the ultrasound scanners to study subsurface rock structures. Similar in appearance, both tools produce a rhythmic, low frequency sound waves. Such sounds appear to have triggered the destruction of the unfortunate Arrakis Geological Survey Team, whose report was available to Trekham at the time. The only survivor rescued by the Naib's tribe told Trekham just moments after the activation of the impact hammer that they were attacked by something resembling a giant serpent. Soon after that incident, the shift to ultrasound scanners began, and impact hammers slipped from common use. Trekham though realized the value of the change. A thumper would become part of every frem kit and was used for two main purposes. First, obviously it called a sandworm. The caller drove his thumper into the more compact, windward face of a dune. He activated the clapper mechanism, which produced the drum-like thumping. A long spring was held in a tightly wound position by a fabric tie. Flipping the tie away freed the spring to unwind. As it flapped around, the spring clapped against a hollow tube protruding from the top of the stake just above the spring. The tube and the stake resonated together to send out low-frequency sound waves which lured the sandworm to the thumper. The second purpose of a thumper was to decoy a sandworm away from a Fremen. When that was necessary, a fuse was put in a hole close to the spring, keeping the spring from unwinding until the tie had been ignited and burned away. The hunted Fremen would escape while the fuse burned, and marauding worms would attack the thumper instead. At the end of the day, thumpers were simple, rather rough adaptations of a tool which had gone out of fashion. But they did call sandworms to their location effectively, and so they were useful when the Fremen wanted to mount or to evade the great makers. So, now that you call the sandworm, how do you ride it? Well, you use the tools known as the Maker Hooks. These devices were actually named after the worms, or so-called Makers on Arrakis, and they are used for capturing, mounting, and steering the giant animals. Probably more than any other device, the Maker Hooks are uniquely associated with Arrakis. Sandworms haven't really survived anywhere else, and occasional examples of hooks that have turned up elsewhere have proved to be just cheap knockoffs carried from the pilgrims to Muad'Dib's planet during the period after the Jihad. We don't really have any information regarding the origin of the Maker Hook or any possible precedents. Fortunately, there are many good examples from the Rackus find itself, and each one increases understanding of their characteristics. The Maker Hooks were long, thin shafts of spice plastic ranging in length from 1.35 meters to 2.1 meters, or 4.42 feet to 6.88 feet, in diameter from 1 to 1.47 centimeters, differing no doubt according to the size of the beast and the degree of the skill of the user. 
At one end of the shaft was bonded a plasteel hook, barbed at the tip and having a radius of curvature of from 10.6 to 12 centimeters. The opposite end was molded to fit the grip of the user and then roughened to a coarseness of 28 grit. The use of a maker hook definitely brings the boldness of a Fremen into sharp focus. After activating the thumper to summon a giant maker, the first mounter, also known as the Hookman, stood aside from the approaching worm. As the maker went by, the Hookman inserted one hook beneath the leading edge of one of the sandworm rings, and then the other hook at a slightly lower point on the next ring. The Hookman braced himself on the hooks, rolling upwards with the worm as it rotated away from the threat of the sand entering the gap opened by the two hooks. Once he was up, the Hookman and the followers steered the worm by opening gaps down one side of the base, prompting it to roll away from the gaps to prevent sand from getting in. The maker hooks were very important in Fremen culture. When a young person was entitled to own the first set of hooks, it was an important badge of adulthood. Some investigators believe that young men earned their Frem kits one piece at a time, and that the maker hooks was the foundation of their Frem kit collection. A hook which had never failed was thought to be very lucky, and its owner was given special consideration. Also, when a hookman missed an attempt, that boded bad luck for the rest of the tribe for the rest of the day. According to the chronicles recording the history of the Fremen, they didn't actually learn the art of worm riding until after two generations after they arrived on Arrakis, in 7193. During those early years in their new home, they traveled either by foot or by ornithopter, finding neither method entirely acceptable. Walking was obviously slow, but also dangerous. And the thopters were machines of the guild, on which the Fremen didn't want to rely. And so, they waited, studying their surroundings, for a method more in harmony with the planet to suggest itself. And that suggestion came in 7265, when a big sandworm appeared close to a party of Fremen who were investigating a spice patch. All but one of the group, a young man known as Rofar, scrambled to the safety of a nearby outcropping of rocks before the worm got too close. Rothar, evidently too stunned by the worm's arrival to move, found himself only centimeters from the side of the creature as it rose out of the sand. He seized the leading edge of one of the worm ring segments and held on for dear life, maybe in an attempt to avoid the worm's flashing teeth. Any report on the motivations of Rothar can only be speculation, because the sandworm he had grasped rolled quickly raising the segment the young Fremen had opened high above the surface of the sand, thereby putting Rothar on top of its body as well. Then it sped off into the desert with Rothar as a passenger. Within just a few days, the first basic hooks had been fashioned, and volunteers out of every siege were becoming sand riders. Refining the technique was costly to learn, however, and many of the early practitioners were killed in the attempt. However, in just one generation, the Fremen's means of travel was firmly established. It became customary for a Fremen youth to call his first maker at the age of 12. Earlier, the youth would have only ridden the worm as a passenger or steersman, never as the mudir or ruler of the ride. The naib of the young person's siege, along with various other men and the Sayadina, would accompany him on the sand. The Naib would speak the words of the ritual developed over the centuries for the would-be sand rider. The other men would loan him a thumper and hooks, since it was considered bad luck for a boy not yet a rider to own these things. The Sayadina was only an observer, so that the events of the day could be properly recorded. If the youth was successful, and most of them actually were, once the ways of the worm were better known, it was his privilege, as the mudir of the sand ride, to command the steersman. At his signal of hi ya, they would mount the worm behind him, followed by the rest of the witnesses. Then, following his calls of ah, which was left, or dirge, which was right, they would guide the animal as they wanted. Not even the naib of the youth siege could counter his orders until the ride had run its course. The young Mudir would be the first one on and the last one off, which was a position that could be dangerous if the worm was still fresh 
and prepare to turn when the hooks were removed. During many rides, however, the worm was usually ridden until exhaustion, and it would be far more eager to escape and rest than to attack. During the years of their oppression, the Fremen's power over the worms was one of their best kept secrets, and the existence of the art itself only became widely known after Paul Moadib became emperor. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Fremen practice of worm writing for today. Definitely a useful and quite innovative method of travel across Arrakis, if you ask me. But, as they say, you gotta use whatever the environment provides. And on Arrakis, if nothing else, the planet did provide plenty of sandworms. Now, if you're curious on how this thing actually looks like, they do show it both in the 1984 Dune movie and in the 2000 miniseries. If you haven't watched those already, that is. What are your thoughts about worm riding though? Do share them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the series, please support it by watching to the end, liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing. Thank you very much for watching and may the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.